Thank you very much. I uh, remember uh, in 1987 when I uh, was speaking in Folkestone to uh, Michael Howard's constituency meeting, and he was Home Secretary at the time, and uh, I arrived. Uh, it was the night of the big storm. Trees were down. Uh, whole swathes of houses were all dark because the power was off and all that, and there was one fellow there. And I thought, well, if he's good enough to come, I will give my talk. And so I spoke for about 40 minutes. And uh, at the end of my speech, I said, thank you for coming. Thank you for your, your polite applause. Uh, I guess I'll leave now. And he said, you can't go. I'm the next speaker. <laughs> it, it's actually, it, it, it actually didn't happen to me. Uh, but it happened to somebody I know. Well, I'd hope to cover three things in my talk this afternoon. Uh, and I'm going to start by saying, when I, was, when I saw this poster, and I saw that I'm nonpartisan, I'm certainly nonpartisan, uh, but I am a political junkie. And when the lady said uh, that everybody was political, I thought, no, 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 I'm not political. But I understood when I saw this nonpartisan. I am intensely political, but I'm certainly nonpartisan. I am certainly a libertarian. I was on the national board of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Association, 45 yeah. years ago. Yeah. 45 years ago. And boy, did we make, have to make some very tough decisions. People would come up and they would say, well, I think that uh, the ACLU is okay, but I don't agree with everything they do. And I said, well, don't worry about that. There's nobody in the board who agrees with everything that they do, because that's the way civil liberties are. So why me? Well, uh, that's one thing. Why are you here, those of you who are here, uh, and why commemorate Magna Carta at all? I'll speak quickly uh, and leave time for questions because I'd love to have a dialogue with you. Uh, growing up in America, I had a very good education in English literature, English history, uh, not least English cinema. I must have seen all the Ealing comedies multiple times. Uh, and that was before tele we had television in Kansas City. And I knew about Angles, and I knew about Saxons, and I knew about Jutes, just. Uh, and then 1066, I knew about 1066 and all that, and in 1215, what happened with the Magna Carta. From, from an early age, for me, it was good King Richard the Lionheart, bad King John, John Lackland, and Robin Hood and his merry men, and Maid Marian, and Little Tuck, and Friar, uh, Friar Tuck, and Little John, and Will Scarlet, and all. I knew about Henry VIII, I knew about Elizabeth the Virgin Queen, I knew about Shakespeare, 18th century. Uh, elegance in architecture, in costume, and certainly in music. And as a teenager, uh, the Ealing comedies like Lavender Hill Mob, Kind Hearts and Coronets, Whiskey Galore, and the rest, uh, and I grew up with the belief that the sun never sets on the British Empire, and did I collect British imperial stamps? <laughs> Lots of them. <laughs> All Americans knew then that George Washington, John Adams, the first and second president, John Jay, Benjamin Franklin, nearly all the founding fathers were Englishmen except Alexander Hamilton because he was a Scot born in the West Indies. On my first visit to Britain in 1957, on my first morning, I got up at the American Air Force Officers Club where I was staying overnight, and I went to the British Museum when it opened to see two things, the Magna Carta and the Rosetta Stone. The first because of the rule of law, and the second because of communication outside the village. To me, these were the two key icons of a civilization, of a civilized society. I became a trustee of the Magna Carta Trust 21 years ago when I became chairman of the Pilgrim Society, which tie I wear today. The chairman of the Trust by charter was the master of the roles, still is. But my first chairman was the late, great Tom Bingham, Lord Bingham. If you haven't read his book on the rule of law, I heartily commended. Uh, then Lords Harry Wolfe, Nicholas Phillips, former president of the Supreme Court, uh, Anthony Clark, David Newberger, the current president of the Supreme Court, and now John Dyson, all distinguished jurists and all distinguished people. Uh, first under Lord Newberger and now Lord Dyson, I now am deputy chairman. 
of the Magna Carta Trust. And it was Tony Clark on his last day before he went to the Supreme Court from being master of the rolls to introduce me, allegedly, to David Newberger, who was coming in uh, from the senior law lords to be the master of the rolls, the head of the civil society, civil, uh, civil law. And uh, they were the guys who ganged up on me to ask me to take over the 800th anniversary. And I thought I was signing up for the British Committee. And having done the Jamestown British Committee as co-chairman, I thought, yeah, piece of cake, you go with the Queen over to Jamestown. Uh, you uh, uh, are treated extraordinarily well by the Virginians uh, and uh, academics and uh, the governor, uh, who happened to grow up in Kansas City, by the way. Uh, so I thought, how can I refuse? And so I agreed to do that. And on the Friday, we had the trust meeting, and he announced that I was taking over the world. And I thought, do I put my hand? No, 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 no. And I thought, in for a penny, in for a pound. So that's why I'm here, and why now? The Magna Carta is also the reason for the existence of the special relationship the bond that bonds my two countries, my native country and my adopted country. And as President Obama observed in 2011 in a speech to Parliament, our system, the American system, of justice, customs, and values stemmed from our British forefathers. And he said in that speech, our relationship is special because of the values and beliefs that have united our people throughout the ages. Centuries ago, when kings, emperors, and warlords reigned over much of the world, it was the English who first spelled out the rights and liberties of man in Magna Carta. So why are you here this afternoon? You believe in freedom. When I mention Magna Carta to people who believe in freedom, anywhere in the world, eyes light up. I'd like to start by testing your own knowledge about the Magna Carta. Who can tell me where the Magna Carta was signed? Runnymede. Well, how many think it's Runnymede? You're wrong. It wasn't signed, it was sealed. Okay. And when David Cameron was asked the question on the Letterman show, where was it signed? I sent him a note the next day. I've known him since he was a brand new MP. And I said, Dear David, if I'd only had been able to have a word in your earpiece, and he asked you where was it signed, you would have said, because I would have told you, it wasn't signed, it was sealed. You'd have said that, and he'd have looked a jerk instead of you. <laughs> when he gave us, I don't know if you recall, but the Chancellor very generously included in his budget a million pounds for my committee to uh, use to develop uh, the, the commemorations all over the country. And David Cameron gave my committee, about 80 people attended, uh, a luncheon period. Uh, where we had canapes and, and drinks uh, at number 10. And his staff said he would come in for a few minutes and say a few words. 12.30 to 2, I thought fair enough. He came for 50 minutes and spoke for 20, very, very movingly. And I'd be showing the video of that if they'd had one. Or I'd be telling you about it and quoting from it if they'd had a transcript. But when I turned to the private secretary and said I'd like to have the transcript or the or the recording, he said, oh, I don't think we took a recording of it. Oh, boy, it was golden. It was really golden words. There are many myths which surround the Magna Carta. There was only a fight between the barons and the king. Well, it certainly was, but not only that. It was the beginning of the spread of modern democracy. Magna Carta was the overturning of the divine right of kings for the first time, other than by chopping his head off. King John, somewhat later George III, power over the American colonists, was subject to the democratic process. The beginning of representative democracy, and as Lord Judge, the former Lord Chief Justice of the United Kingdom recently quoted, nullum scutigeum vel auxilium pontitur in rego nostro. Nisi per commune concilium regni nostri which very roughly translated into American means no taxation without representation. Now which lawyer, which American, which person who knows about freedom hasn't heard that phrase before? But did you know that Americans abroad, including me, were the last to be franchised? 
And when, on the 7th of January, 1977, President Ford signed, not sealed, the Overseas Citizens Voting Rights Act after we lobbied Tip O'Neill, then Speaker of the House, when we got five minutes with him, and they asked me to speak for the group. And we pleaded Magna Carta and the principle of no taxation without representation. And he said, you don't have the vote? I said, no, we have to pay taxes. Well, that's outrageous, he said. And I reached into my pocket and I pulled out a tea bag and I said, yes, Mr. Speaker, and if you don't give us the vote, we're going to come and dump tea in your harbor. <laughs> Do you remember where Tip O'Neill was congressman for? Boston. <laughs> and it was the foundation of human rights under threat now, at home, and abroad as we consider how to cope with the threats which face us in the 21st century and civil liberties as protected in the American Constitution. Magna Carta enshrined the rule of law it limited the power of authoritarian rule. It paved the way for trial by jury, modified through the ages as the franchise was extended. Are you aware of the World Justice Pro Project? Yeah. How many else? Just one. Two. Good. I would think that you agree with me uh, that it's the rule of law, which began in 1215, uh, when King John agreed under duress, admittedly, in shared freedom, not in a less than benevolent dictatorship in which he was the dictator. The World Justice Project uses a working definition of the rule of law, and it's based on four universal principles derived from internationally accepted standards, a system where four universal principles are upheld. First, the government and its officials and agents as well as individuals and private entities are accountable under the law. Two, the laws are clear, publicized, stable, and just, are applied evenly, and protect fundamental rights, including the security of persons and property. The process by which the laws are enacted, administered, are efficient, enforced, accessible, and fair. Justice delivered timely. Remember Article 40? Justice delayed is justice denied, is the principle of Article 40, Chapter 40 of the Magna Carta. It has to be delivered timely by competent, ethical, and independent representatives and neutrals who are of sufficient number, have adequate resources, and reflect the makeup of the communities they serve. Would you agree? How would you rate this country on upholding these principles. The World Justice Project Rule of Law Index measures countries on nine factors. Constraints on government powers, 10th. Absence of corruption, 15th of the 90 countries they rate. Open government, 9th. Order and security, 15th. Fundamental rights, 23rd. Regulatory enforcement, 10th civil justice 14th and criminal justice 14th. And within each of these factors, tests of countries are taken annually and published. You'll not be surprised that consistently the Scandinavian countries are ranked higher than the UK, but there are some surprises. Hong Kong is rated ninth on absence of corruption. Japan is 11th and Germany 12th, while the UK is 15th. We should do better that on fundamental rights, including sub-factors, of right to life and security, due process, <coughs> right of privacy, freedom of religion, labor rights, freedom of expression, equal treatment, and freedom of association, the Czech Republic at 11th, Estonia at 12th, and Slovenia at 13th, all rated better above Britain's 15th place, we should do better. The index is less well known as it should be. I would challenge you, the Freedom Association, to take it on board where freedom and security meet, the Freedom Association stands firm. You can find out more about this at www.oneworldworldjusticeproject.org. Magna Carta also proclaimed certain religious liberties. The English church shall be free. The Magna Carta was Britain's greatest export. Now affecting the lives of nearly two billion people in over a hundred countries. For centuries, 
It has influenced constitutional thinking worldwide, including in almost all the Commonwealth countries, even in France, Germany, and Japan, and throughout Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Over the past 800 years, denials of Magna Carta's basic principles have led to a loss of liberties, of human rights, and even genocide. That's Stuart Wheeler's pet, uh, pet project. Uh, even genocide taking place yesterday, today, and I'm sure tomorrow. It's an exceptional document on which all democratic society has been constructed, described by the German ambassador to me several years ago. When he said to me, when I asked him, what salience does it have in Germany? He said, everybody knows about the Magna Carta in Germany. It's the foundation of democracy, quote, unquote. Thirty-eight years ago, in all its splendor, the House of Commons Speaker and the Lords, House of Lords, Lord Speaker, members and peers, and the President, and the Prime Minister, sorry, law lords, ambassadors and high commissions, the Archbishop of Canterbury and York, met with senior members of the American Congress and Senate, including the speakers of both houses, the Vice President representing the government. They were assembled in a thousand-year-old Palace of Westminster, Westminster Hall, to hand over the Lincoln 1215 Magna Carta to the Library of Congress for it to be displayed this autumn, opening up on the 7th, I believe it is, 6th or 7th, of November. I should know because I'll be there. And it's to be displayed in the rotunda of the Congress as it was displayed for us in Westminster Hall 38 years ago and I was there. This time one of the many things, over a hundred different things from coins and possibly stamps to uh, all sorts of things, I'll come to that. This time the plan particularly that I'm amused by, it, it, I should be, it's my idea, uh, the Supreme, have the Supreme Court organized mock trial with judges and advocates, mainly from Commonwealth countries, because the Queen sent me the message through her private secretary, do not forget the Commonwealth, so we're working hard on that. <laughs> They'll be judging a tribunal led by the President of the Supreme Court, David Neuberger, also with an American Chief, chief American Justice and the Chief Justice of New Zealand judging the barons and bishops in the dock on the charge of treason, telecast and broadcast on BBC World. And no doubt, part of it, it'll be, the whole thing will be broadcast on BBC World, and excerpts of it will be on all the BBC channels and no doubt others. This will be on the 31st of July, the night before the Supreme Court Magna Carta exhibition opens for August and September overlapping with the biggest exhibition the British Library's ever had, starting in November this year. Nope, sorry, that, that's Congress, starting in February next year. Uh, biggest exhibition it's ever held. There'll be exhibitions and demonstrations, pageants and concerts, sound and light shows, uh, open lectures, plays in the Magna Carta towns and cathedrals and castles, town halls and town squares throughout the land here and in many other countries, in Canada, the United States, Trinidad, throughout the Eastern Caribbean, in Southern Asia, in Af Southern Africa, uh, Botswana included, Australia and New Zealand, and everywhere where there are people who value the principles that the barons wrenched from the king at Runnymede. They had to fight for it and were the beneficiaries of their fight. You can follow the commemoration of the 800th by signing up to the Magna Carta newsletter at our website and tell us if you'd like to get involved. My colleague Joe Walsh here has passed out, if anybody didn't get one, a Magna Carta trail that was just launched last week. And those Magna Carta trails are to give an impetus for uh, tourists from this country and from abroad, and we're getting thousands and thousands of yanks over for this. And those will give you a lot of information about where is what and when, and I hope that some of you will take it on board and take a day out, or two days, or three days, or four days, or even a fortnight, by linking those trails. And I hope, in closing, that some of you will be with us next year 
on the 800th anniversary at Runnymede with the Queen, and some as well in Westminster Hall for the mock trial at the end of July 31st, or at least watching it on BBC World or domestic BBC. And I hope PBS in the USA, ABC in Australia, and in Canada on CBC, as well as in many countries, TV stations on the internet and elsewhere in the world. And with just one more thing, although I don't believe it's been announced yet formally, the Magna Carta that is a 1297, the one that was given into law, will be in the Queen's class coach behind the Lord Mayor and the Lord Mayor's show this November. Thank you very much. I don't want to keep anybody from drinks, but if uh, you'd like to ask some questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Sir. Uh, in my experience, Americans care more about Magna Carta than, uh, than us Brits. I'm ashamed to say that. Do you think that's true or not? I'm sure it is, but probably in statistical terms, it's probably not, because America has such a very large population and increasing of Spanish-speaking Americans. And so uh, I haven't done the survey. It's due to be done in February this coming year in 25 countries, 23 to 25 countries, including China, to see the awareness of the Magna Carta and what it stands for. Because when I did a straw poll with my committee, 30 or 40 people at the time who were present, the high person guessed that the level of awareness, just had they heard of the Magna Carta, in contrast to other documents such as the Declaration of Independence, the American Constitution, the Commonwealth uh, Charter, uh, the uh, Texas Refensus, the Lindisfarne uh, document, and the like, 85% uh, knew in Britain, including 60% of 18 to 24 year olds. We were astonished. And of the 85% who'd heard of it, 60% recognized that its principal component was the rule of law. We, but, you know, you don't know about these things until you ask. And that's why we've asked the academic subcommittee effectively demanded to know a baseline so we could then measure that and then at the beginning of the year and then at the end of the year to see how the depth of knowledge about Magna Carta has improved. Next question, sir. Thank you. Um, Magna Carta. Oh, Thank you. Uh, Magna Carta is, is so fundamental. Your name, so. Oh, it's Rupert Matthews. Um, is so fundamental to um, so much of the liberties and freedoms in this country, uh, one of which is the separation of the administration of justice from the, um, the executive or the government and so on. Just as we were hearing earlier from the uh, panel on the police. Indeed, which I miss. I apologise if I'm yeah. rehashing what you've no, already No, heard. no, no. And the, the but question it was an application. It was questions about an application of that very principle. Okay. The, the question I've got then is, uh, can you solve the conundrum which I have, which is so many members of the uh, legal professions, be it judiciary or lawyers, are supportive of acts that see, uh, are tending to undermine that? I'm thinking perhaps of the European arrest warrant, uh, and some of the um, laws that are going through which are giving local officials the powers to, to effectively administer justice rather than it going through the legal system. Why would lawyers and judges be supportive of that? In my, in my case over there, I have the cutting from yesterday's paper uh, that, in, that, makes, that, said, that tells us about the banks dipping into our accounts without so much as a... Uh, of anything to justify it, really. And I remember being outraged and being on the radio and then being castigated for doing it uh, when the Labour Party suggested that the, that the uh, uh, being held without charge should be extended to 92 days. Yeah. And I said, the Magna Carta says, uh, it justice delayed is justice denied. And that doesn't mean in 92 days' time that you incarcerate somebody without uh, license to do so. And they pointed out to me, well, unless it's by the rule of law, 
and if we pass the law, that's it. But this is a country, one of the very few in the world, where the sovereignty is not with the people. The sovereignty is with the Queen in Parliament. This is part of the problem. Now, I can't, uh, not being a lawyer myself, but I spend a lot of time with them these days, uh, particularly with the Magna Carta, because they're very, very active in this. But there are these things that are abuses of the very document that the commemoration is supposed to recall. So I hope that if nothing else, uh, I will be raising uh, the profile of the Magna Carta, not just in this country, and what it means, so that they think twice, legislators and judges, particularly on the application. I must say, my experience with the people who have been, six of them, masters of the role and responsible for civil rights, sorry, civil, uh, the civil law, uh, are clued in. And we see that, certainly, from time to time. But a very good question, Mr. Matthews, and I hope my answer is as good as it can be under the circumstances, but I certainly admit to plead guilty that uh, I share your view. Yes, uh, the chap behind you, and I'll come back to you next. Oh. Yeah, young man. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Vincent Gould. I'm, um, I'm an artist, and I'm... Uh, I'm one of the Brits you mentioned earlier who didn't know anything about the Magna Carta, um, shamefully, until a few months ago. Um, I think because we weren't taught about it at school, um, but I watched a on YouTube a, um, a thing from Freedom Association with Daniel Hannan um, yes. talking about it at Running Me. Um, so it's just a comment, you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, learning about it. And um, um, yeah, so so we are learning about it. Those of us who are a bit younger, and um, as an artist, I think that um, there are lots of ways that we can um, the message can be yes. portrayed through culture. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman in front of you, would you pass the mic straight to him? Well said. Yes, my name's Graham Erdley. I'm the UK PPC for West Bromwich West. Uh, my question is about the Queen's powers of patronage, which Tony Blair obviously used to take to uh, us to war in the Gulf, etc. Um, and how that equates with Magna Carta? Well, obviously, uh, it, it's been mitigated uh, since then because Parliament did have to vote overwhelmingly that did support and all the parties supported it. Uh, I'm not sure if there was a pronouncement by you, Kevin, on that at the time. Do you know? Has, not, has Nigel time, spoken time, on that long time, time. Um, At the time, we were against the Gulf War. We said no. We no, no. No, I was thinking about this most recent uh, recall of Parliament uh, about the, the six tornadoes. Yes, we, we were against the recall of Parliament. We said right. we should have recalled it before he actually did because he clashed political reasons because he clashed with our conference. We thought he'd called it for political reasons. <laughs> yeah. obviously, so. Wouldn't be the first time that was done. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, I I share your concern that uh, we don't we've got a parliamentary democracy and the democracy should be heard. I, I don't think it's as effective as it might be. I came over here as a I trained in political science. I was educated in, in, in political science. Uh, and as I said earlier, I'm a political junkie, I admit to that, but completely nonpartisan because of the work that I do. I've never voted since I became a British citizen, and I will, never will vote as long as I still am, have a role at, uh, at Maury. I, I, I don't know that you mentioned that in my introduction, but I'm best, well, yes, of course you did with Bob Very McKenzie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, George Gallup never voted in America, and he more or less invented modern polling techniques. But he took the view, and I've followed it uh, scrupulously in this country, that uh, uh, I, I know I've been, I've been caught on the brittle several times by Jim Nockerty or John Humphrey <laughs> or uh, uh, Jeremy Paxman, uh, uh, mostly politely, I must say, but I felt awkward, but they never could say, ah, but we know how you vote, as they have others. Uh, I would say, by the way, 
uh, and I mean to speak this evening at 9.30 at the GovNet uh, at the Hyatt, uh, if you want to hear my view and also the public view, particularly the public's view, uh, about the, the Scottish referendum and the implications, and there are some that are just staggering uh, that I'm showing this evening, and on uh, towards the general election and what I think is going to happen. So uh, I won't say anything more about that except that it's in the Scherzo and Joe? Dante. Uh, Dante room uh, in the Hyatt. So if you've got uh, credentials and uh, wish, wish to come to that, we'd, I'd be delighted to see you. Thank you. So Robert, we're going to have to call, call it a hall there yes. if I may. Indeed. Um, may I just thank Sir Robert um, yeah. very much? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.